All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Kovasko, and today we'll be talking about the future of retail. As you might have seen uh, in, there is research that in the past uh, half year, retail has made a jump that was predicted beforehand for the five year time span. And today we're gonna talk a bit about the trends, uh, what's exciting going on uh, in the startups, whether it's in product startups or services data. And we'll start with our special guest today, uh, Amr from uh, Coop, Chief Digital Officer at Coop. Amr, you've started about um, a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. And to me from the distance at Sweden Funtech, it seems mm -hmm. like Coop has made a in the past year, yeah. um, could you tell us? Uh, could you tell us a bit more about what's going on and how do you see Coop evolving as a retailer? And mm -hmm. yeah, how does that connect to the global picture? Yeah, sure. So, hello everyone. Very happy to be here. Um, yeah. So, uh, as you mentioned, I've been at Coop now for for a year now, and uh, I have a background in. Um, in, in startups and, and programming, and I'm a tech nerd, uh, basically, uh, in my blood. So this has helped me drive my organization or run my organization as, as a startup, basically. And uh, having quick decisions, uh, focusing heavily on the user experience, and not so much discussing, you know, what kind of systems are in the background and so on. And this has, you know, as you mentioned, helped us push out several new initiatives that traditionally should have and would have taken longer if we don't take the, the approach that we are taking. So one of the things, one of the first things we did was trying to understand what is important to people. So what we do in this business is ask ourselves the question, what is important to people when they shop? But we removed it when they shop part and just ask ourselves, okay, what is important to people? And you don't need, you know, consulting groups, McKinsey, you know, Boston Consulting or, or Avengers or whatever. You just need to ask Google, what is important to people? And then you get, you know, tons of links with uh, <clears throat> reports from all well, economic forum, from the UN and all these global uh, entities. And they usually list, you know, 10 things. And, you know, family, relationship, love, and so on, time, health. And if you look at these 10, you see four of them are in the crossroads with our industry. And those are time, those are health, sustainability, and money. So looking at that, we try to design our services after those four aspects. So one example is the, the new Scan and Pay app that is in the media now a lot. Uh, and this is a, a service that took us three and a half months to develop. It should have taken 18, according to our ex external partners. Uh, but again, you know, quick decisions. Uh, I'm a tech nerd, so it's easy to understand what part you need to buy in, what part you need to develop yourself, and what part you can use open source libraries for. And then when we build it, you know, we always have in mind these four aspects, uh, time, health, money, and sustainability. Uh, and looking at, at the scan and pay, that's why it's important when you build your services in the future, you build them as platforms and not as products. So you build them with the ability to have others connect to your platforms. So scan and pay is an example, it saves time, but it also enables dietary services to connect to the scan and pay. So when you scan something that you're allergic to, we'll immediately warn you. And this is from an external service. That's not something we develop ourselves. Or if you're on a strict budget, you can you know, connect to one of these FinTech services and we will tell you that, okay, maybe you should buy this instead to keep your budget or, or whatever it might be. Internally, we developed these sustainability declarations that we uh, announced just before the summer. And now, during this fall, we release it in the hands of the customer in, in Scan and Pay. And this is world unique uh, experiences that you cannot see anywhere uh, else. We are actually telling you 
what the sustainability footprint is of the product that we just scanned. So we're exposing ourselves 100%. We're exposing all our suppliers and um, yeah, exciting times. Indeed they are. And sustainability is a quite a broad term. How do you define it at Coop? Yeah, so what we did is uh, we actually used one of these research uh, uh, studies that has been done by global entities. I don't remember the name of them. VHO is one of them, mm -hmm. but there are many others. And they have a set a fixed number of parameters that is important when you look into sustainability, uh, climate, water usage, local working conditions, and so on and so forth. So one of the big uh, issues we had when putting the experience in the hand of the customer is designing an experience that makes you understand is not so black and white always. So let's say something has an average low footprint in terms of sustainability. Like if you have a scale one to five, this product has 1.4. Then you might think, okay, 1.4 is good. But when you look into the details, you can see that all aspects are low, but local working conditions are a five, they're red. Or water usage, five. And that's what you need to understand. Now it's not always black and white. It can be good in some cases, and it can be very much worse in other cases. And this we need to bring to your attention. Uh, I guess it's a complex issue. Um, definitely. In a way, this is a great tool to educate the consumers to make mm -hmm. better choices, right? So would you rather buy, buy something that is regional and local or mm -hmm. more an organic avocado yeah. from Mexico instead yeah. of Spain? Yeah. We could get yeah. It's a bit closer to home. Yeah. Um, and what about the fourth element, the price issue that you've mentioned? Because 60% mm -hmm. of consumers, they say they would love to buy something that is good for them and for the planet, but mm -hmm. then the price point may not be always acceptable for their yeah. wallets. Yeah. I mean, in terms of price, what we can do is, you know, there is a like a inofficial agreement of price level between mm -hmm. all the the players in the market. So there is not much there uh, to do. But what we can do is we hope that as more people get exposed to the actual effect of their choices, then maybe those who are more financially stronger can be the ones that drive the locomotive and, and, and make the better uh, choices. And as we make those better choices, we also work with the suppliers and tell them, you see, you, you have, if you change your country of origin from this to that, then you will lower it a little bit more and the price is not so uh, big, uh, much affected. And more and more people jump on this sustainability train. And of course we can replace, I mean, eventually we can replace all products with only sustainable projects with an average of 1.5 or whatever it might be. Uh, so it's a long journey, uh, I think, but I think we will get there because the way we're acting towards the planet now, that's not sustainable at all. You've mentioned that you're working with uh, multiple external suppliers and providers. How can you? Sorry, that was a parallel stream. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you work with with multiple uh, external suppliers and partners. How mm -hmm. can one partner with Coop? Are you opening your APIs to the public? Yeah. What about the data? Yeah. So we are now uh, rebuilding our own infrastructure, digital infrastructure, and we have a, a couple of principles that we have implemented. One is everything must be API based, uh, internal or external, everything is API based. Uh, and second, every API must have the option to be external. Uh, and then, so for now, if there is something really cool that someone has an idea of, they can always ping me on LinkedIn. But uh, very soon in the future, we will just have a wiki of, of APIs where people can um, request a, a key and then they can do their own thing. Exciting times. And yeah. how long would the transition take to, you know, having more digital retailer? Mm -hmm. And um, how would you imagine a retailer in five years from now? Mm. So I think that's a matter of how well you design the experiences. So. I mean, many people before pre-corona said that, yeah, old people, old, older generation will never uh, shop online. Today, the average age of the online visitor is higher than 
the one we have in the offline, in the stores. So they are way older online than they are in the stores. I guess Corona is helping because corona is helping, people yeah. are much more careful with going out into the physical stores. Exactly, and you can see that you know all these hum bullshit that were you know. Yeah, old people can never do this, can never do this, blah, blah, blah. It turned out it was all just crap. They just needed the right incentives, yeah, I guess. Yeah, they just needed the right incentives. And we, if, we, they, if we create a, a masterful experience, I mean, just look at, I can take myself, I'm still old enough to remember when my parents used to pay their bills in the post office. Mm. You know, today, if you ask an 80 year old, would you like to go back to that time where you stood in line in the post office to pay your bills every month on the 25th? They would say, hell no. The iPad in my couch in the evening at home. Why would I go back to that? So again, you know, it's about an experience. But the iPad experience is vastly better than the experience of standing in line at the post office. So if we nail the experience, there is no question that people will just follow. And what about the delivery times? Right now, uh, there are a couple of services that offer a delivery, same-day delivery, or within an hour. Is mm -hmm. that something that you could imagine could move it towards? Yeah, definitely. Especially if those deliveries are done automatically. Uh, so looking at you know drone deliveries and stuff like that. Already now, you can see Amazon is testing things in the UK, in the US, you know, where they deliver medicine uh, and stuff with uh, drones. And I think that as that technology gets stronger, I think that one hour, two hour deliveries within the cities will be an over uh, within uh, maybe three years or so. One of the biggest impacts uh, of a retailer is the food waste that mm -hmm. comes mm -hmm. through maybe not the most accurate prediction or mm -hmm. changes in the uh, demand of certain products. Mm -hmm. um, how are you tackling that? So it's a combination of uh, new experiences and machine learning. So uh, just recently we hired you know, a head of AI at, at Coop, Jakob Liljedal, very smart guy. And he's also now building a team of data scientists. And AI will be like the electricity uh, in, in a company, uh, especially at Coop. So in everything we do, we use machine learning uh, to, to, to uh, automate and predict things much better than we previously did. So that's one thing. The second thing is that we're trying to add experiences that will help us understand how much do you spend, how much do you throw, and how much do you need. So the scan and pay, uh, for instance, we will open up, I think it's next year, a, fe a feature where you can scan at home. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be in the shop, physically in the shop to shop. You can shop in your kitchen. Uh, and every time something uh, like you throw away something, you can scan it, it adds to your list or to your virtual cho uh, shopping cart. And we will track, you know, when you bought it and when you scanned it again. And then we will know, okay, this thing lasted for four days. This milk lasted for two days. And this toothpaste lasted for six weeks or where it might be. And using that data, we will understand how often do you need replenishment. And Eventually, we will offer a service you know, where you can have Coop as a service and we will make sure that all the basic uh, stuff like toilet paper, um, uh, soap, you know, uh, cans of tomatoes, you know, stuff like that, they will always be at your home because we know exactly when you should refill. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, That's... many do, <laughs> even myself. Um, that... That would be that would be great. Uh, really looking forward to testing the service. And as as Coop is um, a global uh, association of mm -hmm. uh, producers, would would you also share these learnings with Coop in all across Europe? Or right now, it's only in Sweden that this relationship. I would is even share it with Ika if they want to. Great, yeah, Ika. I hope somebody's <laughs> listening. Yes. Yeah. I mean, many things are going to open source uh, as well. Because, first of all, it's in our DNA. I mean, that's what the cooperative is all about, you know, working together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that when we move to the digital context or the digital world, for some reason, Coop lost that um, part of their DNA. Uh, but, I mean, the sustainability database that we're building right now for, for powering the, the sustainability declarations, they will be open source next year, so anyone can access them. 
Uh, so we're spending a lot of millions on that, but we will open source that. And any kind of solution, you know, that we feel that this will help push the industry forward, we will open source it. Can um, developers or uh, how can people contribute maybe to to this open source initiative? Because right now you are putting in a lot of effort and money, but then yeah. maybe there are other companies who are willing to kind of pull the data together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, that's what the open source. I mean. Uh, is, the community is for. We are hoping that when we put them on GitHub, for instance, then we were we are hoping that the community will you know enhance the project further, uh, and we will benefit from it, and, and others will benefit from it because you know it's common sense. We we spend a couple of millions to do, to start something up, and then if we want to take it to the next level, we need to spend ten or twenty or thirty million. But or we can just open source it and have the, the power of the herd just help us develop it to the next level. And that costs us nothing. We have a question here from Mats Broden. Yeah. Um, will you give customers tools to extract data from fruits and vegetables? But what kind of data? I mean, uh, nutritional data, I guess. Or what kind of data are uh, extract yeah. data from fruits, vegetables? I mean, if you're talking about nutritional data or sustainability data, uh, then of course uh, you will see that in the in the in our experiences the apps, but also they will be offered as an API where you can just send in an image or or a barcode and you will get back you know all the kinds of data. Mm -hmm. Great, um, Amr, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, I think you that was a great touch upon all uh, different topics that are relevant to the consumers. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the sustainability information about health uh, accessibility and of course the money aspect of uh, shopping and shopping online mm. um uh -huh. Master said, Mats is now specifying that he meant pesticides uh if it's possible to see the pesticide data but i guess that's part of the environmental impact. yeah it's part of the sustainability declaration great there are 10 parameters there so i don't know which ones but i'm pretty sure they're in, inside there somewhere <laughs> Wonderful. Um, very much looking forward to that. We'll follow your journey and all the news. Um, our next speaker today will be uh, uh, Nicole from the DXC, and we'll talk a bit more about uh, data. Nicole, I see you are popping up online. Amar, you're welcome to stay with us, of um, course, in the room, or if you need to go back to yeah, I have office. All right, great. Thank you very much for having me. Welcome, Nicole Chef. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, you are. And I see you quite clearly. So um, could you tell a bit more about what DXC does? And uh, when I was interviewing you as a speaker, um, my excitement came uh, when you started talking about the data ecosystems. And Amr already started talking about uh, the importance of uh, open sourcing solutions and then uh, do using crowd intelligence to build them up. Now, I think you take it to a bit of a whole new level and uh, that's what we're going to be talking in our next 10 minutes. Absolutely, absolutely. So you want to start with me telling uh, our audience about GXC? That would be great. And then if you can tell us about one of your projects. All right, I'll do that. So. Uh, DXC is not very well known in Sweden, uh, I'm guessing, right? So, so it, it's actually a merger between the sixth and the seventh biggest uh, uh, IT companies in the world, being HP uh, Services as well as uh, a company called CSC. So, so they started to they decided to to uh, build a new brand, and uh, for some reason we haven't marketed that. So, so DXC is not very well known, but we are about hundred thousand people working globally. And uh, what I do specifically is I actually work with uh, a digital transformation for a number of our clients. Uh, a couple of them I'll mention here today because I, I think that's very much relevant to what uh, Amr was talking about. So one of them is uh, Ahol Delhaz. Uh, it's, a, it's a Dutch company. It's a very large Dutch company. It's one of the largest grocery retailers with a number of brands. Uh, they, they are known in Sweden for, for being the majority owner of ICA, once upon a time. Uh, and what I do there uh, and what we do there is handling everything that's data analytics related. 
And uh, we do the same thing for Procter & Gamble. We do the same thing for Nestle uh, and a couple of other retailers like, like Tesco. So uh, I, I do live in Sweden. I'm born and raised here, but I, I usually work uh, on mainland Europe, mostly in, in Netherlands. So on regards on data eco ecosystem, that's kind of an interesting topic, right? So, so I think uh, if we could perhaps set the context first. So I remember... 2009, where uh, uh, somebody, I don't know the name of it, he said uh, that software will, it will eat the world. And we know by now that it actually has. But since last year, we are uh, seeing that AI is actually eating software. Uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't, for our companies in Sweden, it's, it's still a bit of a mirage, a, a bit of a fantasy. Uh, so, so every time I talk to an to, to, uh, organization in Sweden, it still seems far off. And it, uh, usually they refer to, to data or becoming data-driven as BI, but it's not. And I think uh, what Amr did was actually capture uh, the part about machine learning uh, very accurately. And that's what we do for our world. And that's what we do for Nestle. But above all, we enable them to collaborate on data, on algorithms. And not only them, right? So, and I'll give you an example of what we are doing. So, so for instance, uh, uh, I can mention Tesco and Procter and & Gamble where they collaborate on how they could sell more, more products. So uh, what, they, what we do for them then is, is help them out with how to place the, the, the Procter & Gamble pro products in store to increase the sales of it. And, and for, for our whole, for instance, we are looking at expanding the entire ecosystem and building something they refer to as walled gardens. And I think that's a very good term because ecosystems, uh, if you, you often think of it, it's, 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 it's not opening up entirely, uh, although I, uh, Amr is actually talking in that way. I, I see our whole is approaching this as a bigger box. It's not uh, thinking as much out of the box as, as having a bigger box and includes several organizations, including startups in that. And then based on that, you start sharing data and algorithm and you give access to all, all, all the different actors within that ecosystem to, to, the, the, to the play that, that our whole has. I think the, the cool part about this, right? So, so uh, it's it's about all the different uh, new business model that that arise from this, and and that, that's the thing, right? So, so I, I think most of our companies in Sweden and Nordics uh, they still refer to AI and they still refer to being data driven as a solution, as a technology but it doesn't have to be and to give you the context of that i'd like to show one slide if that's okay alex is that okay yeah dear audience if you would like to be seeing the slides bigger you can double tap on a slide and then it will be uh, on top of the screen bigger So what you see here is actually a, a several hundreds of analytical use cases. Um, we already know what kind of methodology is required for, for, one, for each one of them. We already know what kind of data is required for each one of them. So usually when we talk about AI in, in Sweden, we refer to each one of this as siloed solution. Well, I would prefer to have them delivered as either an algorithm or the algorithm provided as a microservice. So we can enable an entire ecosystem from end to end, working on data. And this is a different way of working with uh, data, right? So this is a very much a data-centric approach, data-centric way of working, compared to the traditional way of actually deliver uh, potentially these machine learning models as, as a solution. So, so uh, and that's a cool thing what you can do with this, right? So what, what you actually start with is, is looking at what kind of strategy you have, what, what you want to achieve, and then you apply a different kind of analytical use case on that and try to understand what data is relevant. If you don't have those analytical use case, if there is an, a startup that actually have a model which is really good, uh, then, then you use that model. For instance, if you want to use facial recognition, you can build that yourself. But why don't you use a startup's technology 
where they perhaps have pre-tamed that model for 40,000 faces, perhaps, right? Because what you would do then is, is use their model, and then you, you would have that model provided to you as a microservice, not as an application. So that's one example, right? And that's one example of how you can extend the entire ecosystem. Nikolcha, maybe um, let, let's make, make it very specific. Can you maybe walk us through the case of a company that used data or went through the journey and reinvented itself? All right. So I can actually I can give you an example of Nespresso. I think that's a very good use case, right? So Nespresso is is uh, 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 what they are doing is actually uh, they are entering an area where they are uh, uh, very much focused on customer acquisition and trying to understand the demand and preferences of customers. So they are uh, building relationship with all the the different consumers. And, and based on understanding those preferences, what they are doing is actually feeding that into the Nespresso machines. So when in time you would uh, pour up a coffee from an Nespresso machine, then Nespresso machine would understand who you are and, and provide you the cup of coffee based on your preferences. That's one example. Then you have the Tesco use case, right? I just want to give you that use case as well. So Tesco, for instance, they are very good at, at, at demand forecasting, how they have used that demand forecasting based on both weather, but also based on, on, on potential seasonality. And the, what they're doing then is, is, is feeding that into the forecast, and they are actually telling what kind of demand uh, there are in the different local stores to the local, uh, local food producers. And the local food producers are actually delivering this, and the entire food waste is actually being decreased. So the entire everything starts with the demand forecast in this case, and they are actually having a, a, a dynamics pricing that could even enhance the entire journey of this as well. So, so all of this is data, right? So, so based on, on understanding the data uh, and the demand, they are telling all the people in their ecosystem how to, to deliver based on that. So that's a very good use case, actually. And it ended up with them uh, cutting down a lot of the food waste, making them more sustainable. To what example. about uh, Tetra Park? They have changed their business model quite dramatically. Oh well, yeah, definitely. That's a very good one as well, right? So, so Tetra Park is very uh, is the company that, that delivers machines and packaging where you package liquids. So uh, their model is actually selling machines, or they used to be selling machines and selling package. So usually what they've done historically, they sold the machines, and they actually had a loss on that. They earn the money based on the packaging. So what they're doing now is actually selling output as a service. So what they are guaranteeing a certain output from their machines. So by doing that, they are able to, act, to, to sell the, the competitors' machines, the competitors' papers, because it doesn't matter, right? So, this, so for, for Tetra Pak, what they're doing, they're guaranteeing an output. So by doing that, by, by, by being on top of this uh, uh, food chain, uh, talking to the client, uh, delivering the, the guarantee of output, they can start delivering products in a different way. In this case, they're actually delivering the competitor's papers, the competitor's uh, uh, machines. doesn't matter. So that's a, a, uh, uh, that's a way of how you can utilize data and analytics on, and start changing the entire uh, value chain of delivering in both retail, but also in, as well as in CPG. So three different uh, examples. Nicole, um, to wrap up, what would be your advice to the retailers or the companies that are now only starting their journey to become more data-driven or uh, di digitalized as such? Start taking this serious. Uh, it, it's not a mirage. It's not a fantasy. It's, it's it started last year, and we are actually behind in Sweden. Look at what they are doing in Netherlands and in other countries like Switzerland, right? Because they are uh, ahead of the curve. Uh, look at what they are doing. Start start to implement a, a data driven culture. That's that's uh, something that I would suggest from a from a holistic point of view. Thank you very much for joining us. If you would like to leave your uh, LinkedIn email in the chat for further questions from the audience, we have uh, 50 people watching us. That would be great. Um, next up, we'll have three startup pitches or demos, and uh, they are 
very closely connecting to the topics we've discussed. So for example, Wasteless is working on the dynamic pricing. Um, Why Waste is combating waste at the retailers and Foodla is a platform to connect uh, smaller suppliers to in the mega cities in Sweden. Um, I see Thomas is already here. Thomas, join us on screen and you can be sharing your own slides. Hello, Alex. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. you can... Yes, I hear and see yes. very well. Great. We'll have uh, three minute presentations and then two minutes for Q&A. Um, the time is on. Great. Thanks. So I'm Tomas. I'm from Wasteless. Basically, we help supermarkets reduce waste uh, with AI. So as you might already know, uh, food waste is a huge problem. Uh, almost one third of the food produced is never eaten. 1.6 billion tons of food is wasted, which 87% uh, in terms of the retail industry, uh, it's uh, from the perishable category. Uh, almost 8% of all the perishable products never gets waste. And uh, since that, since uh, in the latest years, the, the main solution they have found is to Markdown products uh, with very steep discounts in some cases of over 10. So our solution, Wasteless, is basically a, a dynamic pricing uh, based on AI solution that allows supermarkets to price and sell products based on the expiration date so that consumer can choose whether to pay a fraction of a price of a product that is expiring in the next few days or uh, pay the full price for a long expiring product. So the way it works, basically, we, we include the expiration date on the barcodes using existing scales and equipment that is available in the retailer. <clears throat> and we also integrate with the point of sale so that uh, the pricing engine is continually running and learning from sales and then deploying the, the, the best price at the best moment for each expiration date that consumers are buying. We have different integrations depending on the on the format and the and the channels that the retailer use. We, for example, in in store, we use electronic shelf labels. We also integrate with mobile apps, e-commerce uh, uh, solutions, and also Scan and Go. But of course, we adapt to to different uh, requirements of each retail, retailer. On a typical project, we usually measure uh, two main KPIs, uh, basically. Uh, revenue increase and waste reduction, sometimes also the margin increase. We had uh, different success stories. For example, here in Spain, we reduced over one third, uh, almost one third of, of the waste, and uh, we increased uh, revenues by 6%. We also have other KPIs regarding to, towards the, the adoption and the customers, for example, uh, understanding level of the discount system, uh, the eco friendly uh, image improvement of the store. A discount acceptance rate. Here, for example, in Italy, the results were even better. We, we reduced 39% of, of the waste. We almost doubled revenues on the SKUs that we were uh, running the pricing engine. Um, and we increased the margin, in, the margin by 1.2 percentage points. This is just for you to, give an, to have an idea of one of our examples in in-store implementation. Of course, uh, the communication part is very important to, to reach customers. We have different uh, business partners basically to, to accelerate the, the integration. We, we integrate, we already have a partnership with uh, point of sale companies, scale companies uh, and the like. And basically this is it. Hope I made it in three minutes. Uh, and of course, I'm totally open to, to questions and any doubt that you might have. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, I spoke back in March and I see that you've actually increased the reductions uh, of, of waste at the supermarket level. I remember numbers around 13 or 17 percent and now it's at 30. So. Congratulations on that. Uh, could you name a couple of retailers that you work with in uh, Europe, maybe? Well, we are still in the process of rollout. So basically that information, we, we try to, to keep it uh, confidential. But uh, in any case, uh, we, we work with large retailers. We are 
were working in Italy, uh, also in Netherlands, and expanding very fast in, in US with different large and small retailers. And what would be and regarding your point there, uh, Alex, uh, regarding the, the results, yes, and basically that's the, the result of AI that continually improves over time. So it makes sense that uh, results get better with time. That's amazing. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Thomas. Please leave your contact details link in the chat. And we'll switch to Ben Holden from Why Waste. Ben, you can come up on screen and join us. Can you hear me? How we go? Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, yeah. From the floor. Would you like right, to share yeah. your screen? Uh, I have, I've had a little bit of a malfunction with the presentation, so I'm going to try and do it from memory, if that's okay. Absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, that's all good? You're good to go. Excellent. So, hello, my name is Ben and I'm from Why Waste and I'm going to give you a quick three minute insight into what we do and what our vision is about the future of retail. It's our mission here at Why Waste to use advanced technology to deliver usable, efficient and data driven solutions for grocery stores, enabling them to significantly reduce their food waste. And to do this, we have developed a of solutions which since our first product launch back in 2016 now includes um, Semaphore, which is our first system, and it's for smart expiration date management. Instead of checking every date on the shelf, only the flag products need to be checked. And the data from this system, Semaphore, is taken into another uh, business intelligence tool called Aspect, and this displays warning lists of frequently wasted and reduced products, allowing the store owners in the management level to adjust procurement accordingly, leading them to long-term waste reductions. Similarly, uh, we have a product called Semaphore Delhi, which is the Delhi counter version of Semaphore, but is modified specifically uh, to allow Delhi counter staff's tasks to be optimized. And this also includes an integration with a Delhi card printer system. And finally, and our latest release is a, a solution called Schema, and is split into two functions and uses advanced machine learning to, to forecast production and ordering volumes. Um, we work along several key metrics and across all our network of several thousands of stores uh, across 15 different uh, markets, we're seeing an average reduction in food waste of around 40%. Um, the time saved uh, on date checking process has become 90% more efficient and amazingly 97% more accurate. So customer claim complaints around out of date products on the shelf has dropped by 97% across our entire network. And um, finally, uh, ultimately, a reduction in food waste using intelligent solutions such as Y Waste is our complete vision for the future of retail. So, thank you very much. I hope that was in three minutes. You're very efficient with the time you over that. Um, <laughs> so, why Wasteless is actually the price and reducing the price on the consumer side. Did I understand right that you are doing this, but with the retailer? So, you are. Yeah. So we're B2B, we're B2B. so we, we sell our systems directly into the retailers themselves to be able to make their, their in-store processes a lot more efficient and thereby reducing the food waste by making those processes more efficient. Right, and then how does the retailer regulate, um, the essentially the re reduce the waste? Um, so through the, through the system, so let's take Semaphore and Aspect as an example. So Semaphore is the system that... Uh, allows the shop floor staff to be able to uh, date check efficiently. So instead of having to pro check every single product on a shelf, which is what we're finding is the, the situation in most stores across the world, they only have to check flag products so that they can make their job more efficient. They can ensure that no products are left on the shelf that are out of date and then have to be wasted. From Semaphore, they, they also have the option, if they do find a product that is going out of date, they can push it to one of our partner organizations or the store's partner organizations, such as Karma here in Sweden, or they can print a reduction label. So it can be advertised to the late night shoppers who may take it off the shelf. That data on whether it has been reduced or pushed to Karma or it's out of stock, etc., is then fed to the business intelligence tool, which is called Aspect. 
And then that is then used by management levels to see which products are most often wasted, most often reduced, and they may have to reduce uh, or adjust their procurement levels accordingly. So therefore, they're not buying in products that are just going to go straight to waste. So over the longer term and the shorter term, we're saving waste or the retailers are saving the waste. Got it. And I like the simplicity of the uh, semaphore system, which is essentially three colors, green, orange and red, depending on the exactly. uh, expiry dates. Are there any questions to exactly. Ben in the chat? Uh, if not, then we'll move forward with the next pitch. I don't see anything coming up yet. I've posted the links to the two uh, startups websites in the chat. So feel free to also add your LinkedIn if you like. Uh, for now, thank you for joining us, Ben, and uh, stick around if you like to interact with the first speakers. Yeah. Uh, next cool. up is thank you John much. from uh, Foodla. John, if you could click uh, share your audio and video, and then I'll bring you up online. There we go. Hi, Alex. All right. And cool, do you see this? Yes, if you can go into full screen mode, that would be great. Uh, let's see here. Okay, perfect. You're good to go. Cool, okay, so I'm, I'm John from Foodla, and I'm going to tell you a bit about Foodla and uh, how we act on the market. So, the market for food commodities is uh, changing drastically, it's moving from being centered around a few huge actors now exploding with thousands of local producers. And at the same time, it's moving from uh, physical stores to online outlets at a rapid pace. So uh, locally produced food is now the fastest growing trend on the food market. And e-commerce within food is the fastest growing retail channel. But right now, there is a huge gap between the local producers and the established online food retailers. And this, this is where Foodla comes in to bridge that gap. So we create a plug and play content management solution that makes it easy for local producers to connect to the established online food retailers and online channels. Uh, it's easy for the producers, it's easy for the retailers, and it's also easy for the customers who can shop the products they want in the channels they are already using. So how does this work then? Well, each producer have their own food account where they upload information about themselves and their product assortment. And then we use a bunch of smart tech and artificial intelligence to make sure that all the products they upload complies with the rules and regulations for selling their products online. And we automatically transform producer taking product pictures into bare laid edited online workable product photos with artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, so, and the producers, they just love the simplicity of this. So we get a massive positive response. Uh, and for the retailers in turn, they can overview all producers and the full assortment. They make their selection, handles the communication and places the orders to the producers through Foodla, all supported by data and optimizing artificial intelligence at every step of the way, turning the hassles of working with several producers far and wide into an absolute ease all so that we can connect the or also that the customers can shop the, the local product from uh, in the channels that they are already using so for the producers this means lower entry costs for going online it means shorter lead times by several months it means increased sales and it also means lower logistics costs that is for the producer. And for the retailer, it's much less administration, it's much shorter lead times to get, to get a producer into their online channel. And uh, it also gives them a, a larger, more accurate assortment uh, of the products that they are selling. Lower logistics costs and the products that they offload and the information connected to those products is actually optimized for all the AI computations and how you make the best suggestions to the customers in the online channel. And this, this puts Foodla on its way to become the digital infrastructure that is in so much need on the local food market right now. Currently, we're plugged into Coop Online and the number of producers uh, connected to Foodla, our customers, is constantly growing by the day. Uh, and this, this is good traction and it's good traction on a huge market that is growing globally. With me, I have the best of teams. Uh, we have all run startups before. We have learned through our previous successes and failures how to build a company, how to create value, and how to make impact that truly matters. 
We just uh, closed our first financing round, uh, but we are running faster than our roadmap. So we would like all of you who are interested to follow Foodla and see if we can collaborate uh, uh, along the road uh, to send us an email and we'll keep you updated with regular updates uh, to keep you in the loop. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Um, Thanks. Wonderful to know our access produce from much smaller farms also in such big retailers as Coop. Um, how do you see yourself uh, scaling moving forward? Is it something that you can make? Can your solution be made available into mm. other stores and when? Exactly. Yeah, I, I would say one of the big challenges right now is that um, you have a structure around physical stores, but the, the fastest growing trend on the food markets is e-commerce, right? And e-commerce and, and the food market is, is like, it's aggregated with so much data about everything. And I, and I have to agree with Amr saying that, well, AI and data is like the electricity in each company and Foodly is basically the engine to, to make use of all that and to shortening like all the bottlenecks that is between a producer and to reach the established uh, uh, channel. So for example, now we're connecting to the stores. So say for example, if a big Coop store has like 20,000 articles on their shelves. Well, if people uh, decide to shop from that uh, store online, they only can have half the assortment. That means like they're losing lots of sales because they don't offer all the products that they actually have in store where they pick the product to the customers that are choosing the online channel. And Foodla comes in there to, to, to bridge that gap and to solve that problem. So we just like taking producers by the masses and uh, and make the the assortment be the same. So yeah, and I so yeah, I think I definitely think like uh, the whole like food industry is under uh, like a, a sort of a paradigm shift, and it's a lot of complexity. And we we sort of try to solve those bottlenecks uh, along the way to make that transition. So that's how basically how we build food like to solve those bottlenecks. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, John. Feel free to leave your website and content details in the chat. Um, we're going to make a brief break for uh, five, six minutes, and we'll be back with more speakers and more topics at 3.15 Stockholm time. Hello, everyone, and we are back to our session on future retail. We started today in the first half of the session talking about how a big player such as Coop can be innovating and evolving and bringing more data, uh, going open source and co-creating with the partners through open APIs, uh, new solutions that are more uh, inclusive, more convenient, saving time and money for the customers. And especially in Corona times, that also opens a lot of opportunities for the uh, older people and to stay uh, more cautious uh, in the current times. Now, um, in our second block, we will venture even more into data and maybe alternative ways and how what could be um, another way of shopping for us online these days. Now, uh, the next session will be a panel discussion with Rob Mc. Iverney from Intelligent Layer and Christopher Johnson, Stock Filler. I see Christopher is already online and Rob, I'm gonna both put you on screen now. Hello. Hello. Nice headphones, Rob. Uh, something more stuff the next time. <laughs> <laughs> I could see tech guys when I see your headphones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Um, let's start with a quick introductions. Um, could you start? Let's start with Stock Filler. What is it and what do you guys do? Okay, cool. So, my name is Chris and I'm one of the founders of Stock Filler. Um, and, you know, speaking of a day like this where we talk a lot about data, I think it's quite interesting because a thing I was wondering about just a few years ago is like, how do we even have food? that we eat from grocery stores, restaurants, and web shop. Like, how does it even get there? It doesn't magically appear, obviously. Um, and I just thought that everything came with a big, massive truck. And that's kind of true to one extent. 
I think in Sweden, 70% of food is what we call central distribution. So that's what's handled by the big chains and, you know, the really big warehouses. Uh, but 30% is directly delivered. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we can eat, you know, local differentialities and, and actually not every store is the same. But that's a system that's been living for 100 years. Um, and it's strange on a day like this that we still haven't changed much of that fundamental system. Um, we have new innovations in, you know, production, product, analytics, but we still plan, you know, Christmas sales one year ahead in the biggest uh, retailing channels for food. Um, so that's where we're looking at. Um, I also had a look at your company, Rob, um, being kind of fond of beers myself. I think that that's an amazing idea. Uh, but I think that's really, really hard to innovate, especially if you're going through the big channels and bring a new product to market if you have to plan a year ahead. So our mission is basically to create a world where the global food, food industry is truly connected and sustainable. Kind of like in the old days when you needed to call someone, you know, to buy a stock. And now we have all of these online platforms and everyone can save for their retirement. Um, so stock filler is basically trying to, you know, transform the underlying structure of the food industry and take it from, you know, this inefficient, stagnant, actually very wasteful siloed system and make it more productive, agile, sustainable. What about you, Rob? What are you bringing to the future? Yeah, sure. I, I, was, I should probably give us a little um, background as to where I've got to today, which will probably make the most sense. So I actually, I started um, working in machine learning. I did a PhD in machine learning and I was looking at how you design algorithms that can learn from experience. So really kind of replicating the way that humans learn by trying things out, making decisions, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And I took that and, and uh, built that really as the kind of fundamentals of my of my last business. So you're talking about the beer business, which, which is actually, I've, I've finished with now, but I'll explain why. Um, the problem in that business that we were trying to address was actually most of the products, or a lot of the products rather, I should say, that we're consuming, especially food and drink. Um, a lot of those brands haven't changed in a very long time. And the example I always use is something like Budweiser. You know, in a hundred years, the only thing that's actually changed with Budweiser is the packaging. You look at something like iPhones. I mean, in 13 years, we've had 25 iPhones, right? So there's a big discrepancy there. And what we wanted to build with uh, Intelligent X was a, a food and beverage company that could uh, make products, food and beverage products, iterate as fast as technology iterates. Um, we build it based on this premise that actually you have to create different products and put it in front of people before you actually understand what people's preference, true preferences really are. And so we were developing an AI system that could, could manage that experimentation process. We created a beer brand. Uh, we called it the world's first AI beer. Uh, and the idea was that those recipes would change based on feedback. But actually in building that business, we hit a massive roadblock. And, and you kind of hit the nail on the head there. The roadblock was the supply chain. You know, forget about making dozens of different products. Actually successfully making a single product efficiently is hard. You know, and actually we're talking a lot about waste here, uh, not just not in this session, but across a lot of sessions over this program. You know, there are so many inefficiencies in food supply chains and the way they're run. Added to that, changing market dynamics, added to that, changing, you know, increasing demand volatility. Um, these are the sorts of problems that actually need to be solved first before you can dream of this future where you have personalized products exactly where you want it. So my current business, Attentive, that's what we're trying to solve at the moment. We're addressing what we, the specific part of it that we're interested in, which is what we call uh, the issue of kind of data asymmetry. And, and by that, I mean that upstream people like manufacturers and producers, they really struggle to get hold of things like point of sale information. You know, how many products do we actually sell today? It takes a long time to get that data from the till all the way back to the farmer. Uh, and downstream, you know, we heard from Amar talking about uh, providing kind of sustainability information. You know, the increasing amount of uh, retailers and restaurants are starting to demand more data from their suppliers on things like provenance. So if I go into a shop and I buy some palm oil, I want to know that that's been sustainably sourced. Getting that data is hard and sharing it across the supply chain is hard. Um, as a business, we're specifically focused actually on, on demand forecast, at least initially. Um, you know, we want to be able to better help companies predict 
uh, what's going to be bought and therefore how much product they need to be making at any given time. And, and the, the reason we're focusing on demand forecasting is really because we think, um, you know, it is the beginning of a lot of upstream uh, supply chain planning. And then how can you push this information down the supply chain? Because you might predict demand for your own product, but then can you share it with the suppliers? How would that work in for more complex products? Sure. Well, I mean, actually, I think there's kind of three parts to, to the solution we're looking at. I mean, the, the first part we've kind of talked about in, in, in a few of these sessions, and that's around just making data available. So at the moment, it's point, kind of passed from partner to partner to partner. The first step in this is is delivering what we call it a, a demand driven supply chain, and what that means is just making data available in real time, uh, shared across multiple parties. That's where we talk about things like supply chain networks. Um, we talked about data, data ecosystems already. Um, there's challenges with that. You know, a lot of people are using different systems, and so a lot of the challenges are around kind of data connectors. How do you connect one system to another? Um, the second part that we're looking at is actually improving forecast models themselves. Once you've got that central repository, you can start to use machine learning to absorb a lot more data, not just historic sales data, but things like seasonality, trends, social media data, review, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and actually the third part, I think is a more uh, recent development. Um, you know, there's a, there's a military saying, which is like no plan survives first contact with the enemy. The reality is forecasts are always wrong. They will always be wrong doesn't matter how good your machine learning algorithms are, you actually need to uh, build new processes so that um, you can move from kind of deterministic planning to, to dealing with probabilities. You know, a lot of our work is um, instead of producing point estimates from demand, we're putting distributions over the, the likelihood of, uh, of a particular demand taking place. Uh, I mean, Garner talks about something called resilient planning, uh, and, that, and that's, you know, making use of things like cloud resources where you can start to simulate thousands of what if scenarios uh, across your supply chain using digital supply chain twins and things like that. Once you start to acknowledge uncertainty and variability in your supply chain, then you can start to make better decisions. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Christopher, you're working with over 700 suppliers and 2,500 stores, multiple restaurants. Um, I believe that generates tremendous amount of trade data. How are you using it or how do you deal with the predicting the demand? Yeah, and I, I wanted to elaborate on, on Rob's point there because I think that's kind of the interesting bit. Um, we hear a lot about data. Uh, I also see a lot of efforts like in the big retail chains, for example. Um, and the problem is that you can do a lot with data internally if you have it, and that's kind of where they're grasping onto that data as well. I mean, it's, it's valuable. Uh, but there's another problem because you can only use that data for the actual supply chain that you have connected. Uh, thankfully, not everything is through the super big warehouses and the, the privately owned trucks. But I mean, the problem is you can make the smartest system ever. If you're not connected, it's gonna be really hard to change anything. And we have a system right now that's really optimized, you know, for Spanish tomatoes, avocados flown in from Mexico. You pre-plan everything. That works great. But say that you come up with a new product. To say that you, your old beer, for example, like, how are you going to get that out? Either you get it listed, and then it's like a year of discussing that, or you need, and thankfully, 30% at least of products arrive this way. You need to talk to each individual store, and they're not enabling you to you know just go in and jack up your computer to that store you actually need to call them so we have dairy producers for examples you know they sell blue green and red milk but they're still spending like 10 percent of their cost you know just managing orders in their local community and that that's crazy and that's also not a, a cost that we can manage in this industry so i think in able to you know change this we also need to open up and the big retailers for example to actually give them the capability, because I understand they have a responsibility. So if you have a really well-built supply chain, you're gonna trust in that supply chain. So you know to be able to make them a able to supply, you know, more fun, uh, cooler products, um, you actually need to you know put up a robust system, put it away so you can get big traction, actually connect everyone. So that.
we're trying to work, you know, to actually get all of these great, uh, great data ideas working because you can't mail your order. Right. And uh, how do you see the system evolving in five years? Can we expect more uh, personalized products as Rob was experimenting with? or um, smallholder farm cheeses, milk being available in to average consumer? Yeah, so I, I think the, the biggest demand facing retailers, especially the established ones, uh, is that the consumer demand is just ever fast and uh, rapidly changing. And I think that's the biggest thing that they have to face right now if they want to stay relevant. Um, and to do that, you, you kind of need to open up the workflows that you're doing right now. So you need the collaboration from both parties. That's why somebody can't do it themselves um, unless you're creating new channels. So I think that there are gonna be a lot more brands, a lot more locally sourced, a lot more collaboration uh, to actually get these products into stores. Uh, and I think, I think that's just opening up now. And I think it's scary when you start to do that because you've been relying on a system that's been basically the same for the last 100 years. But I think when that starts changing, that's when you actually can get all of these products out and get them out in a you know, cost-efficient manner so they actually can compete on a fair basis. But, but it needs to be you know, kind of a change in how we think and how we approach. I would say change is on the way. Um, Rob, any closing words from your side? Well, I think in terms of what we expect to happen, I mean, you know, we're, we're very focused on, on food waste at the moment. I think there was an article that said BCG uh, estimated something like 1.6 billion tons. So like, and that equates to something like 1.2 trillion dollars wasted every year in food. And you know, one of those UN sustainability goals is to halve food waste from farm to fork by 2030. So I mean, if you start to think how much uh, opportunity there is there, um, you know, th these are the things we should be aiming for over the next kind of five to ten years. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, please, if you would like to uh, share your contact details in the chat, otherwise uh, stay in and listen in to uh, the conversations going on. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Cheers. It's been a pleasure. Um, our next speaker is Johannes Kuber from Paradiset or Paradiset 2.0. Can I invite you to join me sure. in the chair here? Wonderful. Could you tell a couple of words about yourself and your entrepreneurial journey? Uh, well, I've been an entrepreneur for the last 10 years, approximately. Um, started in occupational healthcare, and then I founded Paradiset, which means paradise in, in Swedish, uh, kind of like a Swedish Whole Foods grocery chain. And um, did that for the last five years until we were hit by Corona, like a sledgehammer, and we had to shut down shop and now uh, we will reopen in January but completely digital so Corona secure. Wow so essentially what we've been talking about of, of moving more to online and making better products available on one platform that's exactly what you're doing. Yeah it is because we learned a lot of things in our journey and um, there are basically three things that is um, stopping the trend of sustainable food products being sold more than they are. And the first one is price, the second one is um, information, and the third is availability. And we think that uh, by thinking in a bit new ways, it's uh, possible to solve all three problems. For example, so we've heard from Amr uh, at Coop that the traditional retailers are keeping the prices basically for organic products or the better sustainable products as they are with the market uh, averages. How are you planning to solve this? Well, um, I think you need to sort of rethink how you operate the, the grocery chain. I've, I've been at Lidl before, so I know how the big ones oh. think and, and work. And you need to, to do something different. So what I've been looking at is um, other models in other countries where they use membership models. It's becoming more and more popular for online subscriptions and everything. And we thought, why not uh, implement it in, in the food system so that you actually subscribe to uh, be able to get really, really good prices. And we also buy direct from, from local producers and, and producers in general. 
And combining those two revenue streams, we can actually sell products at way below market price up to 40% discount. And then it starts to get interesting because that's like where the conventional products are. So you can actually buy organic instead of conventional for the same price. That's an incredible number, really. Yeah. Um, in Germany, there are very popular farm cooperatives where you can buy shares and essentially prepay farmers' income and then get the products delivered seasonally to yeah. you from a specific farmer or a couple of farmers. But that gives you only limited access to the fresh fruit and then you have to go to another store to get all the basics. Yeah. Uh, what, how, how far are you going with this? So we're, in the beginning, we're going to only sell dry goods because the logistics of fresh goods is a nightmare. And Coop is struggling with it, Martel, Ica, all of them. Nobody is making money. They're losing lots of money. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the dry goods in the beginning, and then we're going to use a French model uh, called uh, La Rouge qui dit oui, something like this. My French sucks. Um, where the producer and the customer actually does the job of logistics and distribution. So they take care of it, and we manage the, the assortment and the payment and, and sort of all the places. But that's going to happen in maybe a year or so after the summer. Does that mean the consumer need to pick up from the farmer directly? Or? No, no, it's going to be um, pick up points um, around, like if we say in Stockholm, there's going to be a four or five pick up points. So the, the farmers uh, go to one place and, and um, the consumers come and meet them there. So they sort of share uh, part of the journey. Brilliant. It's um, been very big in, in France, it's like 900 pick up points in, in, in France right now. So. Let's see if it works here. And when can we expect that in Sweden? Uh, we hope to be able to launch that in August. And we're hoping that we can work maybe with Foodla, like you saw here before. Uh, we have some amazing companies that are really good at the, the tech side. So we are all about collaboration. And um, hopefully, we can inspire others so that we we'll build a big community of good friends, corporate friends, to help to increase the sustainable food production. That's what I'm all about. I hear today a lot about the open source and collaborative development of the future food network and uh, supply systems even. And I think this is one of the uh, really important things to underline that there are so many players, there are so many bottlenecks that all together in collaboration by sharing data, by uh, opening APIs, we can move forward with um, better food for the planet really. Um, how big is your team? How, how are you making this happen? So currently we're seven people and uh, everybody's working for free right now. Uh, and uh, we're actually going to grow a bit more. Uh, but we've learned a lot of lessons from the past journey, not to be exposed by uh, loaning money or taking in too much capital or, or at all. So, so we're going to be very restricted with that. And, uh, and then we'll grow as, as fast as we need, but we're uh, going to outsource as much as possible because there are great logistics people, logistics players and distribution companies. And so we try to work with the best and, and then stay focused to what we're good at. And I think that's, that's the way forward. Great to hear. Um, what's your take on the um, online delivery? Is that something that you would integrate in the platform or rely mostly on the consumers doing well, for, for dry goods, I mean, there is the convenience factor, and especially in times like this, when you have a pandemic going on, uh, I think uh, it's important to be able to um, help out most most of the customers who are really interested in, in, in sort of helping sustainable food right now are parents, and they have busy, busy lives with kids running around making life, their lives terrible, like, like mine. Uh, so it's really nice to get the food deliver at home, but we need to find new models where we can solve the problems with last time delivery and, and, and work together so that you can actually maybe get a um, bundled package delivery of, of many different players. So I think we're just seeing, we're in the beginning of, of, of the distribution era as well to start co-packing and co-delivering. Mm -hmm. um, and as Sweden Food Tech, we have run a Bloomberg Accelerator, and one of the portfolio companies was uh, Vembla, that does the last mile delivery within yeah. 60 minutes yeah. with our cargo bicycles within Stockholm. So I think that could be one of the solutions. For Absolutely. And right now, they are 
as far as I know, I'm the only player stuck on, but uh, the space is open for so many more to come. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there are a few others, but, but yeah. And, and, and I think it's good that there will be more competition in the area because um, Stockholm is a great city for, for biking delivery. So, so it's going to be an exciting couple of years now, I think. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us today. Thank um, you so much. Looking forward to having the fresh fruit as well as the responsible drug goods. Yep. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we have a couple of more uh, pitches coming up, and uh, we'll talk a bit more through them through about the supply chains and the transparencies in the supply chains. Um, next up is uh, Trust Trace pitching, and uh, I'll put up the other startups in the chat. Welcome, Shamik. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, Trust Trace is also one of the Bloomer startups that has been on the journey with us, Coop and uh, Norhoyan Foundation since March. Um, Shamik, you have um, three minutes to present, two minutes for Q&A. The floor is yours. Thank you. And you guys have trained us very well with this format. Thank you. Perfect. So yeah, Trust Trace is a digital platform for product traceability and transparency. And what does it mean for uh, a common buyer is, uh, so if you look at it, all of us, I think all consumers, uh, we can call ourselves millennials or Gen Zs or our parents of millennials or uh, Gen Zs. Uh, we are all very, very interested in the sustainable products. And I think this is becoming very, very critical for brands and retailers. And they are struggling to move, make this transition to more sustainable products. Plus, they are also having significant amount of regulations to coming in, uh, typically like climate change, uh, 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 Paris Climate Agreement or uh, transparency with respect to product. And then, of course, there's good amount of competition coming from next generation of food brands like Oatly and all who are pushing these large brands to make increase the percentage of sustainable products. This is where I think the product communication is going. Uh, we all walk, when we walk into the supermarkets, we typically are choosing products where we have the full story of the product on the label or we can we are able to scan that uh, this is happening across uh, industry which is food also fashion um, trust Trace started its journey in the fashion industry around three and a half years back and in the beginning of this year working with the uh, sweden food tech and Norken and uh, coop uh, under the bloomer accelerator we made the transition to the food industry but in the fashion industry we have helped brands like Philippa K and Residus to ensure responsible supply chain and sharing this information with their end customers. Uh, in fact, during the COVID times, I was hearing somebody mentioning that it has helped them to have much better orders. I think this is where we are also seeing across industries that uh, sustainable and traceable products are driving 35% higher sales turnover. So what we in the mean, what we are trying to say is that bigger brands need to make a transition to sustainable brands faster. Smaller brands need to scale up their supply chains so that they are able to fulfill the needs better. So how does Trust Trace helps these brands and retailers is we take away the data complexity associated with collecting supply chain information and we also reduce the accurate or uh, improve the accuracy levels of this data significantly. Uh, just to give an example, I think Coop is launching a, a, a spider web story where they will be sharing the complete sustainability uh, product level footprint to the customers, right? Where Trustrace comes and helps uh, companies like Coop and other retailers is helping them to get sustainable products by which, uh, by, by getting granular data across all the ingredients of the product and assess the risk associated with it and working continuously with these brands to reduce this footprint continuously and that is what we are doing how we do it is we help these brands and retailers to understand the full journey of the product right from the source of each of the ingredients to the final product something a tree structure like this and at this level, we are able to assess the risk associated at every level, be it with pesticides, be it with soil erosion, water consumption, various things, and then you improve on this. 
specifically in the space of traceability, I think we have done a significant amount of work across fashion and food brands now, or food is just a new entrance, but in the fashion industry, but we believe we can scale the food side very, very fast, given our knowledge of the fashion industry there. The core team act, uh, has four founders and we all come from a significant amount of background in tech industry and coming from India and moving to Sweden, we have seen the bad and the good of sustainable supply chains. And that is what uh, we are delivering. We, that is the experience we are using to deliver a simple and intuitive solution. We are also backed by uh, backing minds, which are who are investors in us and also our guide to enter the Sweden market, uh, which is Sarah and Suzanne. So in simple terms, we help companies who assume that who want to become sustainability leaders. Uh, we help them to make that transition. And we are a mission critical platform for such companies. If you want to get in touch with me, please, uh, you can note down my email address and anyway, I will post my contact details in the chat also. Thank you. Thank you, Shamik. Um, how do you deal with the multiple languages and the global supply chains? So in the platform, we have allowed uh, up till 23 languages, uh, the platform enables. We also use bots. So if even if the email is sent to us in different languages, we can translate it in our platform. And uh, different regions, in fact, in the platform, we currently have got around 4,000 suppliers across fashion and food. Uh, spread across 26 different countries. Uh, and we leverage technology, social technologies significantly. We have integrated with WeChat, WhatsApp, uh, even uh, suppliers are able to interact with us in those languages, uh, those channels also. And uh, how much effort does it require for the supplier to provide the information? It depends. So some suppliers who, uh, so if the supplier has got many products, of course, initially they need to spend some little bit of time to come in, but we keep it very, very simple. We do not want them to get uh, super trained on our platform. The platform is very simple and intuitive to use. Uh, and we have seen that uh, even for uh, various projects, suppliers don't spend more than an hour or two every month, max to max. And some of the suppliers who are very, very big, in fact, uh, who want to manage their own supply chain also, they also use our platform and they find it also super interesting for them to use the platform. Could you name a couple of uh, brands in uh, fashion or in food industry that you work with already? Yeah, I shared, I think a few names, but uh, typically all the sustainability champions, as we call it, uh, companies like Houdini, Philippa K, Iceberg, uh, Fial Raven, uh, many of these famous Swedish brands, but large brands like Decathlon in France, Cezanne from France, then Auto Group in Germany, uh, River Island in uh, uh, UK are also using the platform. We just entered the food industry. So Coop is our first customer, but through Coop, we are also working with around 18 different uh, brands now. There is a question around the verification of the information. How do you make sure that the suppliers give you the right information? So there are various means and techniques for it. So uh, we, uh, if, if we are able to get a deep data or transaction level data from the supply chain, then we do something called mass balancing or product segregation. If you're not able to do that, we, build, uh, we also use certified materials. So for example, if a particular produce has got an organic tag, we will take that certificate. We'll, we'll believe that uh, certificate is correct and then tag it to a particular lot of uh, ingredient and then we uh, track it. Uh, it is not an easy thing. Uh, we use multiple techniques around uh, collecting the data, verification, ver verifying it, and we leverage artificial intelligence and blockchain to a large extent. Uh, with that, we are able to increase the accuracy of the platform. But again, it is not 100% foolproof, but we are constantly in search to improve the probability of accuracy. Thank you very much, Shamik. Um, I, I, I'm a strong believer that we need to know more about what we consume, whether it's clothes or food. And it's great to see that, uh, for example, Coop is gonna be releasing a lot of this information that you are working in this direction. And I'm sure uh, 
in the end, there will be way more information available for the end consumer. Uh, exactly. And, and I think it, it it's a journey, right? It will not happen in, in two months or three months. I think we'll have to invest our time, effort. And as consumers, I think we should choose products which are more transparent. Uh, Certainly. And go there. Next up uh, will be Jason Charnetsky from Radara. Jason, if you can share your screen and come up online with us. Can you see me? Yes, we do. Welcome. Nice to see you. Uh, I hear you quite well. Uh, you can also share the slides if you like. Great. Can you see my slides? Yep. Wonderful. So I just get started. Please do. Great. Thank you all. Um, as we've heard from everyone today, uh, grocery retailers are increasingly competing for green consumers and COVID-19 uh, is furthering uh, our traffic on uh, online food purchasing. And so Radare's goal is to make everyday purchasing more sustainable and easier for the consumer. Um, our market research, and now you should be seeing a bunch of milk cartons, so just to make sure my slides are working. Our market research shows that many people want to contribute to a better world by purchasing more sustainably, uh, but they find that there's too much information, too much greenwashing, and they're confused uh, when they're buying products. And so using product data, uh, human experts, sustainability data, and artificial intelligence, our technology enables retailers to empower and guide their consumers towards making more sustainable choices. Uh, we've developed a sophisticated sustainability assessment platform um, that collects a large amount of sustainability criteria and translates this information into accessible and actionable information for end use consumers. Uh, we have B2B solutions. Our B2B solutions are designed to integrate directly with retailer platforms, uh, offering consumers uh, more sustainable alternatives to products in their basket while they're shopping and when they're checking out online. So as the customer shops over months and months and through interaction with our uh, ranking algorithm, uh, multiple items in consumers' normal shopping basket will have been replaced. And the idea is that gradual nudging over time, that this makes a difference in the carbon and environmental footprint. And this will be apparent as we track statistics for individual consumers. Um, the good news is that sustainable products also have a premium attached to them. And sometimes even consumers can buy uh, more sustainable products uh, at the same price. And what's good business for the planet can be good business for our retail partners as well. As well. So um, our hope is that by using uh, data for good, um, we can make buying sustainability um, honest, uh, more intelligent, and easier for the consumer. And we'll do this by providing our Radar rankings, which is product rankings uh, that we can export through an API to our retail partners and also uh, our Radair Replace, which is personalized product recommendations, uh, which show more sustainable options for individual consumers. Um, what I thought I'd do now is uh, show you a demo of what the customer journey might look like. Uh, we've used, because uh, Coop was a sponsor for this, we hope we don't, they don't mind that we used their website uh, to show this. And, and these are only mock-ups of what our solution could look like to the end consumer. Um, but we plan to tailor our solution to the needs and preferences of our retail clients uh, because we want to ask our retail clients, how can Radare accelerate their sustainability goals and their customers' sustainability goals? Uh, so there's a number of features in our product journey. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, we could have the Radare button. And when you turn that on, uh, it can give you an option between Radare rank and Radare replace. Uh, here, when you choose Radare rank, uh, you can see that the perhaps the more sustainable option uh, gets larger compared to all the other options. Or if you toggle over to Radare replace, um, when you hover over a product, it could suggest a more sustainable product uh, for you. Uh, or a trip over to your uh, shopping cart uh, could show things you've previously purchased in the past 
and how we might replace those over time with some more sustainable suggestions. And in the shopping cart view, um, we could highlight, uh, instead of buying the product you envision, we can highlight a more sustainable product uh, that ranks higher on our product ranking algorithm. And when you do the right thing, uh, you know, we have to come up with some sort of fanfare at the end, uh, perhaps, you know, with some, some nice feedback or a rewards program that we can do in conjunction with the retailer. Uh, so that's Rudair. That's a quick demo. Uh, thanks for hearing me out. And I'd uh, love to, to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Jason. There was one of the questions in the chat. How do you define sustainability? We spoke with Coop about they have eight parameters and then um, Shamik and Trust Trace, they track the whole supply chain and verify the certificates. What about you guys? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously, depending on what product or retailer you look at, you'll hear things like we have nine criteria or 11 criteria. I think the largest challenge is that um, we can't think of sustainability as a linear problem where we rank uh, us from zero to 10 in one criteria and zero to five uh, on another. Uh, for example, imagine a product made with child labor that would rank zero, uh, you know, negative infinity. And so we couldn't compare that to somebody, something else. So the, the advantage of our solution is that it allows us uh, to have a nonlinear solution where we can compare products against one another, uh, teach our artificial intelligence what the, what, why some things are more sustainable than others to provide an overall ranking. Whether this information, how far in the supply chain do you go? Uh, sure, I mean, ideally, you know, we would go through the whole life cycle of the pro product. Um, you know, all the way from extraction to production to distribution to disposal. Um, our platform, uh, the idea is that we will incorporate product data, uh, which you can get from privately available sources or publicly uh, available information like manufacturer websites and scrape that information from there. Uh, there's also sustainability data, uh, which we can get from uh, environmental engineering research and life cycle assessment, and then also comparative comparison sustainability data as well, right? How do we compare the different two products, right? You might have one product that ranks a very high on one category, it's organic, but it might have not very good packaging or a challenging situation where you have two products that uh, look very similar, are bo both organic, uh, but there might be something small about them which suggests one is more sustainable than the other. Sorry, I can't hear you. Thank you, Jason. Definitely would be interested to follow your journey and uh, see the direct retailers. Um, Great, thank you. Our next company is uh, Coppola. And so far, we haven't touched upon the packaging. We spoke about waste, but what Coppola is bringing on board is the flood packaging solution. I see Hayan already here. Hi, Hayan, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Uh, should I start sharing the screen? Yes, please. Okay. Can you see? I see your screen and you have your time on. Thank you. So, hi everyone, I'm Hayan from Koepala and we create innovative food packaging for sustainable and convenient meal. Uh, so as you have may seen, there is a fast growth in ready-made meals and convenient foods, especially during this pandemic time. And this has created a huge uh, packaging waste problems, but consumer demand both uh, convenience and also sustainability. So that's why retailer and food brands are struggling to find a packaging solution that can fit both environmental regulation and also customer expectation, but still be able to compete in a low machine industry. So this is our solution, Guerpala Aterimo, a flat and flexible packaging that in, uh, optimized for industrially packed. 
and it's completely flat before and after you you less space and weight during transportation on the store itself in customer shopping bag um, at home and also in the trash bin and it's still able to open into a rigid bowl for eating and then after fold for easy recycling and disposal so um, unlike others alternative we want to provide sustainability and reduce the carbon footprints on whole range from the production to increase the, uh, increase the recyclability. And even more exciting, um, if you look at the photo at the top right, so one packaging format uh, can be used for different cases, depends on how you open it. If you follow the instruction, you have a bowl for eating. And for example, if you fold and put a straw, you can have a drink, drink box. So only one packaging format for the whole meal. And beyond sustainability and convenience, I wanted to talk uh, about adaptability. So our solution is both materials and also uh, feeling like independence, which means with the rapid change in the material innovation, we can always update to a better one and also fit with uh, regional environmental re 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 legislation and recycling scheme. And also uh, it's optimized for industrial uh, pouch filling uh, and it can work with any filling lines which means uh, we can start with only low initial investment and um, to summarize in nutshell we use um, pack flat packaging design to combine sustainability convenience and adaptability and uh, uh, this is our business model we work on uh, licensing business model uh, license includes uh, both the packaging solution um, and also uh, value added services. And um, of course, to do this, uh, we uh, owe uh, the pattern of our products. Uh, we currently have a product pattern uh, granted in Europe, Finland, US, China, and the technology is protected um, at the Chase Secret. Um, and right now we are working with a top industrial uh, food producer in France and also have uh, two licensing under negotiation. Thank you for listening. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing, Diana. Um, what is the material that you work with uh, right now for producing the bowls, the packaging itself? Yeah. So currently, we work with uh, we're piloting our solution with 100 fiber-based uh, material. So um, and it can be recycled fully in the cardboard bin. And what about the um, branding? Because right now I see uh, all the product photos are using your own brand. Is it something that uh, is easy to, for example, uh, rebrand for the other? Uh, yes. Um, so uh, when um, it's our business model, it's uh, based on the licensing for packaging manufacturers, but we also provide the uh, brand's uh, customization for retailer and food uh, brands as well. Fantastic, uh, super interesting uh, use case, I would say. Um, that was the last pitch for today. We have touched upon the uh, change process that's going on within the traditional retailer. Uh, we have spoken about a completely different way of delivering food through, for example, Paradiset, whether it's uh, an associate farmer association that delivers or there is a player such as Paradisa that you can order through and get access to more sustainable food, uh, transparency of the supply chains, packaging, leveling the playing field for the smaller producers and giving them better access to the market. Um, and then uh, first and foremost, data and how can collectively we use, we can use data for building better solutions and um, changing the food system for better. Um, that's it for today when it comes to the future of retail. This uh, session is over. If you like to chat or continue the conversations, uh, you can click on people and then uh, call and or chat with an individual person. Or if you would like to network within the conference, you can click on networking on the left side of the screen to uh, be matched with anyone uh, and continue the conversation there. 
Um, my name is Alex Kovbasko. I work with the Sweden Food Tech, and it's been my pleasure to be hosting you here today. Stay tuned.